So our next session is sweeping changes to Australia's healthcare system, and we have two uh, leaders in the field uh, presenting to us uh, today to talk about this and to talk about very recent uh, experiences. Uh, this is the issue on um, people's minds across the globe. Uh, and our first speaker, uh, Dr. Theresa Anderson, has 35 years of experience, both as a clinician, but also in health service leadership, uh, and is the CEO of Sydney Local Health District. She's going to reflect a little bit on this moment, but um, as you'll come to appreciate, and this is true also of our second speaker today, uh, she has led a, a major response uh, of significance, not only to the health district, but to the state and the country. So I think this will be a very interesting session. And Theresa, I'd like to welcome you to the stage. Thanks so much, Eric. And it's a great privilege to be here with the Royal Society uh, to share our journey in COVID-19 and what fabulous presentations to be following. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting. Um, and here it is the Gadigal people of the great Eora Nation. I'd like to pay my respects to elders past and present and emerging and all Aboriginal people who are here today. And I have to say, one of the things that I've been most proud of in our response to COVID-19 has been our partnership uh, with our Aboriginal communities. And for us, it's been the Aboriginal Medical Service Redfern, um, which is the oldest Aboriginal medical service in the land. Um, and together we've continued to provide safe services and make sure that our Aboriginal brothers and sisters have been safe during this terrible time. Um, and it has been a really challenging time. I'm going to talk a little bit about some boring things like governance, which has been absolutely critical um, to this response. But the sustainability of healthcare systems around the world has been a significant matter of debate. And it's come really to the fore uh, with COVID-19. It's reinforced that we need sustainable and robust health systems uh, if we want to have a healthy community and a sustainable economy. We're now in the money game. Without health, you know, this state, this country would have much greater economic pain. But I'm going to share with you our journey and some of the things that I think have contributed to New South Wales and Australia responding in a really positive way uh, to COVID-19. There's been lots of learnings. And in New South Wales, it has not been luck. People keep saying to me, gee, we're so lucky. We're lucky we live on an island. The UK is an island. Um, we're lucky we live on an island, uh, that we can close our borders. UK could close the borders. Um, and the fact is that it has been systemic change. We build on terrific governance in New South Wales. Uh, governance within our health system. We have a public health system that acts as one when it needs to act as one. We have local health districts, um, but during COVID, we have acted as one. Uh, we have strong local health districts and facilities, and we know how to manage a pandemic. We've had a few trial runs at it, um, but that's taught us the importance of having strong emergency operations centres, but very importantly, a structure to manage the pandemic. Uh, and in New South Wales Health, we set up the State Health Emergency Operations Centre with the leadership of the Secretary. And you've seen our Chief Health Officer every day there with the Premier, there with the Minister of Health, giving information, giving data. Don't you love that the community love data? Um, and listening uh, to what we've been doing. And that's then reflected down to a local health district. So we have 15 local health districts, but during the pandemic, we've operated as one. We've had structures that have brought us together to make sure that we're communicating with each other, we know what's happening with each other, and we can use the collective resources of 160,000 staff. 160,000 staff all rowing in the one direction. At a local health district, we've reflected the same structures to make sure that each and every one of our staff feel connected to the strategy that we have. 
So we've prepared our, our facilities and boy, our engineering staff have been amazing. We've created triple our intensive care beds, who would have thought? And that's through them being really creative and inventive, um, changing the way in which we run our hospitals, creating designated COVID wards so that we could rapidly expand. Uh, as I said, tripling our intensive care capacity, having hot and cold zones, getting our equipment in, which was no mean feat. And luckily we started ordering at the end of January because we were watching what was happening overseas, despite also managing um, the impact of bushfires on the health of our community. We were very focused on signage and, and marking so that people were really clear about what was safe, what was where you had to have additional attention, having enhanced cleaning, infection control processes, PPE, 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 uh, for the whole community, not just for our staff, and our patient flow and our pathways, and preparing our services. And what does that mean? It meant stopping our non-urgent elective surgery, but still making sure we were looking after our patients, making sure that we put telemedicine in place so that those patients were still being cared for cancelling face-to-face outpatients but substituting with telehealth, um, making sure that we had um, visitor management. Hospitals are really busy places. How do we safely look after each other? We look at how hard it is to manage the people in this room. We have thousands of people every day coming to our hospitals that we need to keep safe. Making sure we had workforce surge plans so that if we did need um, to expand our workforce, we were able to do that. So we contacted Qantas when they were putting people down and said, hey, have we got a job for you? Um, and our Qantas people have been wonderful. They have really supported our staff and done an amazing job using our university students in new and different ways and changing to virtual meetings, 1.6 million minutes of virtual meetings. We have the best MDTs that we've ever had everyone comes because it doesn't interrupt their day. Um, so it's made us safer and preparing our staff. And how did we do that? Because we needed to focus on their well-being and their safety, as well as making sure that 160,000 people knew what we needed to do. Um, making sure that they didn't take COVID home. So we gave them all little care packs. My staff put together 12,500 care packs so that our staff wouldn't take COVID home to their families. Communication, we are really good at the webinars now and the interactive ones, not as cool as Jordan, but I tell you, it's really good being able to do the Q&As with all of your staff and everybody feeling that they're able to ask and give ideas. Um, managing the fear, worry and anxiety. You know, how terrible to watch your colleagues overseas dying um, and know that every day that you're coming to work, it's like a war um, and this thing is there and it wants to transmit. And so we needed to protect our staff and New South Wales Health and the government did an amazing job in accessing the right PPE for our people putting in place welfare programs to make sure that our staff were supported because it, it impacts on your mental health and wellbeing. If you're in full PPE for all of your shift and the fear that that creates, making sure that they felt safe so that they could provide the very best care to our patients, implementing staff screening and visitor screening really early in the pandemic, make sure that we were protecting our patients and our staff. We set up tiger teams, and I know you all know about tiger teams, but our tiger teams are really special, um, and accommodation, and I'll come back to that. And then managing the, the, the um, pandemic itself, having new ways of working. I never thought I'd work in the airport or on a cruise ship or uh, at a railway station, and we've been in all of those places. Setting up COVID clinics and pop-ups, um, our contact tracing is the best in the world. Everyone knows that, and that's not good luck. It's absolutely wonderful planning and a sustained investment in public health for a very long time, and we haven't cut that. Even when times are tough, we have not cut our public health response, and that is what we see now. And supporting our people at home who are being isolated, uh, our special health accommodation and police accommodation, we'll talk about quarantine in a minute, and a hotline so that we could contact people with their results. And very importantly, focusing on our vulnerable communities in boarding houses, public housing. Um, we have the largest um, 
public housing towers in New South Wales. And we saw what happened in Victoria if we take our eye off the ball. So we need to make sure that we protected our vulnerable people. Um, and you know, in my district, we have large population of people who are rough sleeping. I'm really proud of what the city has done to get people off the street and into safe housing. Why can't we do that all of the time? They should never go back. We should be doing that. Um, we have 5,000 people living in boarding houses. A boarding house can be a 20-room old mansion with 90 people in it, nine people to a room with cooking facilities being a fry, electric frying pan. Um, we're really proud that we have not had COVID-19 go through our boarding houses. We've had one person who was COVID positive in a boarding house. So what would we, did we do? We moved them all everyone in the boarding house into our special health accommodation, did a terminal clean of the boarding house. Um, we're very much loved by the boarding house now. Um, and not one person um, got COVID-19 um, as a result of that. Um, and making sure we protect our people in social housing. So our plan, if someone in social housing uh, contracts COVID-19, we move them into the special health accommodation and all their close contacts. That's what we do. We don't lock it down. And this is just a heat map um, showing that sort of um, where our rough sleepers are, uh, our boarding houses and our social um, housing. But COVID has led us to new models of care. Um, our tiger teams, our flying squads, we do like a sort of little, you know, name, special name for uh, our innovations, RPA Virtual and the Shah. A tiger team, everyone knows what a tiger team, and we're from the inner west tiger team, Balmain, you know. Um, and it has great resonance with our staff, and the tiger teams are there um, to care for our staff. That's their sole job, to keep an eye on our staff, to make sure that they were putting on their PPE properly, that they were donning and doffing, um, and making sure we had clear eyes on what everyone was doing. And also providing support in unusual environments. Um, that, that little um, cavalcade there is uh, when we went to pick up the uh, crew of the Ruby Princess who were positive. So we had 50 of the crew and we had them in our care for almost two months uh, and we had great outcomes for all of them. Um, our health hotels, um, our uh, COVID safety support teams and, and we were one of the first uh, health services in the country to do mask fit testing uh, for our staff and that's now been adopted across the state. Our flying squads literally have been everywhere, man. Um, they have been, as I said, to the harbour, to the airports. I know more about the international and domestic airports than I ever wanted to know. Um, but we have worked in partnership with the other government agencies to make sure that when the borders closed, uh, that we safely managed people who were coming into this, the country um, and anyone who was symptomatic came to our special health accommodation. RPA Virtual is a new way of caring, and I have to say that we, when we had the idea for RPA Virtual, it was around um, having a, a better way of manage people, people rather than them coming to emergency departments, people who had chronic conditions, uh, people who otherwise shouldn't be in hospital if they had the right care in the community. Um, and I was in Israel last year, and I got the projections for the emergency department at RPA, and it would have been the size of Canterbury Hospital, and I thought, that's not going to be very functional. Um, and so I sent a text to my staff in November saying, uh, we need RPA Virtual up and running by January. And I got a text back that said, uh, January 2021. And I said, uh, 2020. Um, and so our staff worked really hard to get it up and running. And without RPA Virtual, we wouldn't have been able to um, manage uh, the response to the pandemic in the way that we have. We've now, it was up and running by the 3rd of February, which was the same day, as you know, that uh, the World Health Organization announced the pandemic. Um, and in that time, they've seen over 5,000 patients, both within the community um, and within our special health accommodation. The feedback has been incredible. And again, I think it's our own minds that 
cause the barrier for people adopting new ways of doing things. Our patient experience has been amazing. It has such acceptance across all age ranges. And I have to say, it was a little ages because I thought older people would dislike it. They love it uh, because they feel safe and cared for and they have increasing contact. We've managed a significant number of COVID positive patients, um, now over a 1,000. Um, when we did this survey, again, our COVID positive patients felt really safe, both within the community and within the special health accommodation. Um, and also we've had a lot of people who are COVID negative in the special health accommodation um, and we've been able to support them. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that, but again, their acceptance of RPA virtual in addition to having face-to-face -face staff has been quite amazing. Uh, it was great hearing the presentation this morning about quarantine, because I've lived quarantine. Um, so on the 27th of March, I got a call saying, Teresa, have we got a deal for you? Um, we need you to go to the airport and swab anybody who's symptomatic. And when they, um, if they are symptomatic, then they're going to be in your care for the next 14 days. A lot of people come through the airport. Um, and so basically we established special health accommodation and this had been accommodation, we had been providing accommodation because we're a quaternary hospital um, and we have people from rural and remote areas. So it wasn't a big leap, we thought, um, to be doing accommodation to support uh, returning travellers. Um, but it's there to provide comprehensive health services to people who are either COVID positive, at risk of being COVID positive, who, or who have complex health needs that aren't appropriate for quarantine. Um, and um, all of the people who are in our special health accommodation are patients. They all have an electronic medical record and there are very strict rules around the management of those patients. And I'm really pleased to say that although we've had over a thousand people who are COVID positive, we have had not one instance of transmission, not one instance of transmission to our staff. Uh, and that's because we have really strict protocols. We separate floors uh, physically. We have a governance structure just like a real hospital, um, except it's in the apartment blocks. So I think I am the best customer of Meriton. Um, I have 750 apartments, and today I have 570 people in my care in those in that. Um, in the special health accommodation. So it's a subacute hospital in a way that we didn't think. So we're not doing a big barn. We're not doing a quarantine station because a quarantine station protects the community. It does not protect the individuals within it. We need to make sure that we look after them. Um, only health, health professionals are allowed in our special health accommodation. Police and security monitor the perimeter. Um, our health workers are within the facility. Um, and we work every day with the SHEOC and the FEOC and the police um, to make sure that everyone is safe. And if anyone becomes positive within the police accommodation or they become unwell, we grab them quickly and we move them into the special health accommodation. And our outcomes are amazing. New South Wales has taken the burden. 68,000 people have come through the international border and through our quarantine program since it commenced. Uh, and as I said, we've had over a thousand people within the special health accommodation who are COVID positive, 667 um, through the international borders. And we have had no bad outcomes with those um, uh, patients. Um, only 17 have had to come to hospital um, who are COVID positive. We've had over 300 that have come to hospital because they've had cardiac conditions or oncological conditions, et cetera. So this is just a little graph to show you our positive cases, uh, which is the dark purple, and our negative cases, so it's continuing on. Um, and all of these people have been admitted to RPA under a COVID pathway because RPA provides the clinical support for the 5,500 people we have at any one time in hotel quarantines. So when they come to hospital, they need to be uh, managed as if they have COVID, and many of them do. So I'm just going to flick through, so don't worry. Uh, I'm not going to go through every slide, but this is the timeline. And when we think about how fast this was and how fast we had to respond in all of these new initiatives, it tells us so much about our health system, but also about our community. 
So we've got lots of learnings from this about what's good governance, what's good strong governance, and we're very lucky because we've got a really mature health service that hasn't had a restructure for 10 years. Please, no restructures. Um, we have mature and stable structures. We have a really strong public health system with a strong centre and strong local health districts that come together, you know, and we come together not only with our public hospitals but with our private hospitals. You know, the community, if they realised, would be so impressed by the level of cooperation and collegiality that there's been a focus on the health and wellbeing of our staff so that they could care for our patients and a focus on communication. Our leaders, our community leaders, we had an outbreak in Lakemba um, and we had our community leaders out there telling people to come and get tested, getting them to feel trusting uh, in our public health system. And that community engagement and partnership, not only with other government and non-government agencies, but with the community and our patients, is actually what has held New South Wales and this country apart from other countries. The use of data and evidence, and don't you just love that the community loves evidence? and data, and let's make sure that we keep being transparent and keep sharing that information so that they can actively make decisions. Like Jordan was saying, trust people. Uh, it's really important to trust them. Um, acting hard and fast. We had an outbreak at Concord Hospital. Everyone knows it. it was in the paper. But we hit it hard and we hit it fast, and I put <coughs> 200 people off because we weren't sure and we had no further transmission. So we isolated them and we took the pain but it stopped it in its track. So being agile and being speedy, being diligent with the documentation, being fast doesn't mean that you don't have documentation. And as Jordan said, listening to the ideas of our staff, all of our initiatives came from our amazing staff. Um, they need to feel empowered, um, but we need to make sure that it's done in the right way that makes it safe for everyone and making sure we continue to focus on research. And so we've had so many opportunities out of this, new models of care, new ways of working, new partnerships, uh, and new ways of caring. So uh, in conclusion, um, I think we've not done not too bad a job, really. Um, <laughs> but I think one of the things that it has done is it's reminded the community of the importance of a strong public health system. You look internationally and it breaks my heart. 500 people died yesterday in the UK uh, from COVID-19. Um, we need a public health system that is supported and nurtured. Uh, those countries that have under-invested in their public health systems or even worse, decimated them. You know, the NHS, one of the leading health services in the world, has been decimated by austerity, um, and now they're paying the price for that. Let us all learn from this. Thank you.